I got to talk a little bit with Apostle before service. This is something that's uh, literally been uh, drilling in my heart for probably about three months. And uh, if you want to, you can go ahead and turn to John chapter 2. This is also for you ladies in the back because I forgot to tell you what scripture I was going to. And I was telling Apostle, the thing about John, the whole book of John, is that it's written with such beauty and, and, and it's really artistic the way that he captures all these different, we always call them nuggets. All these, he puts all these secret little nuggets in, in every chapter. And what you'll find in the book of John is that uh, John, when he talks about wonders and signs or miracles, he always refers to them as signs. And I was telling an apostle, I said, we, we come in here and we talk a lot about first mention, the law of first mention. Pastor Jonathan has done this sometimes, the law of first mention. That means the first time that you see something, that's probably the way it's going to be for the rest of the time throughout the scriptures. And uh, of course, you all know me. When I get up here, I, I like to talk about the manifestations of Jesus Christ. I love to see his, his power, his movement. I mean, I, I know those are the things that actually captured the hearts of the people. At one point, it, was, it said that his fame spread because of those signs, yeah. wonders, and miracles. You know, I'm not, and, but the thing about a sign is it's, it's no different than if I'm driving down the road and, you know, the big yellow caution sign comes up and it's got the squiggly thing with the arrow pointing and, and then says 30 miles an hour, an hour right below that. The sign is not the thing, yeah. right? The sign's not the thing, but the sign is letting me know, hey, there's a thing <laughs> right up here. And that you had better be cautious of that thing, because if you don't slow down to about 30, you're probably going off the road, right? So I'm saying all that to say this, that the signs that Jesus done was not the thing. Yeah. It may have been the thing that captured the attention of people. It may have been the thing that, that, that grabbed people's hearts at that moment, but it was not the thing. The sign is to point us to the one performing the signs. Right? And that's what John has done so good. If you go through the book of John, the whole, the whole book, I'm not talking chapter, I'm talking the book. If you go through the book, there's seven signs in the book of John. And he goes in such an artistic way to make sure that all those signs point to Jesus. I mean, I was telling an apostle before service, I mean, this is one of the, you know, the, 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 one of the only Gospels that don't start out with a lineage or just the stories of Jesus, which I, don't get me wrong, the, the stories of, of Jesus are in the book of John, but he starts his out with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God in the beginning. So right off the bat, he's trying to get us to look somewhat at a different viewpoint. That's what I love about the Gospels, is each author gives you a different viewpoint of Christ and, and through their own eyes. But John does it so artistically. So let's go to uh, John, the second chapter. And even, even at the back of this book, when John begins to talk about the signs, it's almost like he's closing out. I know there's 21 chapters, but in the 20th chapter, it's almost like John's closing out the book. And at the very end of the 20th chapter, he says, there was a whole lot more, of course, this is a Brock Cox version here, I'm all, you know. There's a whole lot more signs that Jesus done that were not written in this book. He said, but the ones that were written are so that you might know him more deeply, have a more intimate relationship with him. So even at the end of the book, he's calling them signs. And he even tells us that the only reason I picked these seven signs and wrote them in this book is so that you can have a special viewpoint, have a right viewpoint of who Jesus is and the accounts that were, that were written. So it says this. Everybody there? Second, John 2, I'm sure it's behind. No, it's not yet. John 2, first verse. It says this. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine was all gone, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what is that to you and me? My time has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stones water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to the servants, fill the water pots with water so that they... Filled to the brim. 
And then he said to them, draw out some now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water, which had been turned to wine, knowing not where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone else serves the best wine first. And when the people have drunk freely... Then he serves, which is not so good. But you have kept the good wine until now. And this was the first sign Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, his deity, and his great power. And his disciples believed in him as the Messiah. And they heard and trusted him and relied on him. Well, Father, I praise you. And I thank you for this word that you've stirred up within me, Father God. I, I pray as I always do, somehow, some way, Father God, let the words that come out of my mouth resonate with these, my brothers and sisters tonight, Father God. And let it sink deep within them, Father. And let me be able to communicate in a way, Father God, that would bring revelation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now, I was talking to, of course, Brother Peter ain't here. I was even telling the apostle before service, you know what? You, we start this story out, and there's a, there's a wedding going on. And me saying that John's so artistic about this, and his viewpoint always wants to point back to Jesus, right? The very first thing that he says is on the third day. What's the first thing we think about when we think about the third day? That's our resurrection, man. That's when Jesus come up. He, 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 he was back, baby. You know, so this culture and th this time, it, is, it blows my mind how in-depth God is, knowing that there would be a people that someday would read on the third day, and boom, the first thing we think about is Jesus, right? So John puts, I think it was on purpose. John puts that in, I know it is, because if you read this first, or the second chapter of John, it's not chronological at all. It don't go in order. What you're going to find is Jesus uh, uh, turning water to wine, and then the next thing you know, he's braiding a whip, which we know that that happened within the last week of his ministry, right? So the second chapter of John is not chronological at all. So, and I know that he done all this on purpose so that we can have this viewpoint of Jesus on the third day. Now, Jewish custom, even now, is that you get married on the third day. Now we get married on, what, the seventh? Saturday, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the third day. And the only reason that, I don't want to say that because I, I, I don't know. But I know that one of the foundations of where this came from is if you go back to the creation, if you go to the third day, because he, pro he proclaimed all of them good, right? Yeah. But on the third day, he done it twice. So the Jews saw that, and they saw that the, the, the third day was extra favored by God, so that would be a real good day to get married on. <laughs> Amen. We, for some reason now, we, we want to do it on Saturday in June. You know, that's just, that's just our custom. <laughs> You know, it's, it's just a Saturday in June. You got to do that. It's just the wedding. It's a wedding season, right? But on the third day, John knew that that would hit us. He knew that, that well, I want to say he, he knew that it would hit a group of people to automatically spark the thought of Jesus right there, right off the bat in their mind. It says that on the third day that Jesus went to a wedding and his disciples were invited and his mother was invited. That's a good point right there. Sometimes I got some things going on. Sometimes there's some stuff that's boiling up inside of me. I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one. Life happens sometimes, and I, I feel like I'm in, a, I'm in a sticky mess, and I don't know what to do, and I don't know how to go about it. You know the reason Jesus was at the wedding? He was invited. All I got to do, if I got a thing going on, all I got to do is invite him. All I got to do is say, Jesus, you're invited to my thing, whether yeah. it be a wedding thing, whether it be a party thing, whether, no, whatever the thing is, Jesus, you're invited to my thing. Yeah. Because you best believe that when Jesus shows up, good things going to happen. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Good things going to happen. And that's exactly what he, see, at this time, Jesus has only got six disciples. And he looks at him and he tells you, I, I'm telling you guys, that there's going to be some things happen. And it's going to blow your mind. There's going to be some good things happening. And little did they know that not too many days after that, the good things was going to start happening. And here's how the story goes. They're sitting there. They're having a good time. They're, on the, they're, they're having a wedding feast. And, and back to Jewish tradition, a wedding wasn't like a wedding today. A wedding we have, you know, it may last a total of two and a half, three hours, maybe longer. If it's a big wedding, come in, we say our vows. We have a reception. This was not a reception. A wedding back then was like a three-day feast. They would get married. Get a hold of this. They would get married, 
Okay, they did have a little uh, uh, transferring of vows and things like that, like, like we would be used to. But what would happen is after the vows, they had this tent set over to the side. Okay, yeah. And the bride and the groom didn't disappear for wedding photos. <laughs> but they disappeared for wedding stuff. Right? And everybody else just kind of sat and waited. And then when they came out, oh, glory to God, they're married. The blessing bride and groom, right? I mean, that's, where that, that, uh, that's probably where that comes from, the blessing bride. I mean, that's a... But that's what would happen. And then when they come out, that's when the party would start. And what happens is uh, they go in the tent, they do their wedding stuff, they come back out, and the party starts, the feast begins. And not too far into it, Jesus' mother makes an observation. Okay, Mary is not looking at Jesus and telling him to do anything. She, she's, she, she just knows that in an honor-based culture, that when you throw a party or when you have a wedding, this is a catastrophe that has just happened at this place. Because in an honor-based culture, if, if weddings don't go off right, I mean, you go three generations down the road, hey, that's a, that's a Cox family. You know, the ones that run out of wine... That's them right there. Shame on them. So what Mary's doing is she's, she's at a, oh, Jesus, they've run out of wine. And just like I read it, and the way that we want to interpret every time, Jesus looks at it and says, woman, what is that to me and you? Or maybe that's just my uh, chauvinistic pig mentality that, that, that <laughs> interprets. Maybe it's my filter. But that, I, 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 that is, that's how I've read it. And not like he was looking at her and being mean, but it was like, well, I mean, really, what's that, what's that got to do with us? When really he was looking and saying, he wasn't saying that's not my problem. He was saying that is no problem. Because what he says is, It'd be like when I go to Pastor Chip in the years past, and I'd say, Chip, I've got this going on, and I don't know how to handle it. And one of his favorite sayings to me was, Brock, this ain't no hill for climbers like us. And that's what Jesus was saying to Mary at this time. Mama, this ain't nothing to me. He says, and my hour has not yet come. In other words, I've got plenty of time. This ain't nothing for me. It wouldn't be no different if me and Jocelyn was at the movie theater and we see a young couple up ahead of us, and we see there's kind of commotion going on and something just ain't, ain't quite right, and we can, we can see them they're digging through their pockets and, and looking, and, and, and Jocelyn, would, of course, because she would be the one that would have to notice, because I wouldn't. Brock, we don't have enough money. And I'd say, it's just 10 bucks. What's that to us? We can, I mean, we can do that. And discreetly walk up there, hey, it's on me. So okay it's on me that's what Jesus was doing at this wedding yeah. he was just saying I can, I, can, I can take care of this it's no big deal it's no big deal now what you really got to think about is as they take this of course I, I'm jumping way ahead I know I ain't got a whole lot of time but I definitely got to go back what he does is he looks and he looks down and he sees these bulls and it says I read that version of it, the Amplified Version, because it gives us a little bit of a visual. It says that each one of these bowls is 30 to 50 gallons. Wow. Okay? What these were for, it tells you right there in the Word, is these was used to fill up the ceremonial baptisms. What the Jews would do, they'd go down in there and they'd dip themselves seven times and go through their, their prayers and, and their cleansing. Okay? They'd do that seven times. So I'm, I'm, the guys was probably looking and thinking, oh, man, is this guy seriously going to be another one of these really religious guys going to make us do this baptism thing all over again? But what you also got to think about is this is 130 to 150 gallons of water. They ain't going out and turning the hose on and filling these bowls up. This is drawing water, baby. I mean, this is, this is, this is going to take some time. So Jesus gives the commandment, and the boys go, uh, and that also tells you right there that we know that he wasn't looking at his mama saying, woman, because if I talk to Melanie like that, woman, what are you? It, it doesn't work. Are, 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 is your next words out your, is, Yeah. Is the next words out of your mouth going to be like, do whatever he tells you to do? <laughs> that right there tells you that we know he wasn't talking in that tone because he looks, she looks at the boys and says, whatever this man tells you to do, 
you do it right now. So they do. They draw the water, and after some time, and Jesus looks around. He's like, where's the wine glasses? I know they're, they're all empty now, but where's, where's one of the wine glasses? Take a glass and take this to the head, steer, or the head waiter as they put it in this. And somewhere in translation, this water turns into wine. And a head stir, of course, we, know, we just read it, a head stir, gets, he, he's excited about it because most people, you know, they, they, they bring out the good wine at the beginning and it says when everybody is freely drunk. Some version says when everybody's already drunk, then you bring out the uh, $2 or, uh, or $2 uh, dollar a bottle of Boone's Farm. You know what I mean? You, you get out the junk stuff and you bring it in because nobody will going to know now. You know what I mean? They're, they're, it's, it's done too late. But this guy gets so excited. And he says, you have saved the best for last. And the bridegroom, of course, he's completely clueless about the only thing this guy knows is he heard a rumor a while back that we might be running out of wine. Yeah. And he's looking at him, he's like, <laughs> praise God. <laughs> yeah, he didn't have a clue. Didn't have a clue that Jesus had just done this. That the miracle was performed and the water was turned into wine. And this is a complete picture because if you get to reading in the, in the Old Testament about the times when the prophets begin to prophesy or how they begin to imagine that the reign of God would start or when the Messiah would come, they would say things like the vats will overflow yeah. with wine. Not only that, but the favor of God itself in the Old Testament would be when your vineyard was full and it was ripe and it was ready to harvest. You know, there are scriptures that says that the mountains will run with aged wine, sweet aged wine. So every, a lot of the times when the prophets thought about the rate of God coming in, it correlated back to a time when you have lots of wine, lots of fruitfulness. So it's almost like Jesus is coming out party at this moment. When the head waiter says, you have saved the best for last. It points us right back to that ark that Pastor was talking about, that he had saved the best covenant for last. Yeah. And he said, I want you to look at this picture of Jesus performing this mighty work, this mighty sign, and the sign was just to point you right back to the covenant that I've promised you, the covenant that would come with Jesus. And as I said before, Jesus does two different things in this chapter. Turns water into wine, and then the next thing you know, he's going up to the temple, and he's making a whip. And he begins to wind and strip. And a lot of times in the church, or even in my Bible, it said the cleansing of the temple. But this was, this was more like a protest of the temple. Because the whole time Jesus is, is walking, he keeps looking at that temple. And every time he looks at that temple, because the temple was the center of that culture when it comes to the religious the religious culture, the, the temple was the center of that. It hadn't, there was no more looking up to God. There was no more talking to God. It was about the temple and going to the temple, making the sacrifices. And only the, uh, they had the, the Holy of Holies and, and, the, and the outer courts and all these different things that made up the temple. And there was only a select few of people that could ever go in there. If you wanted to go into the Holies of Holies, you had to be a priest. I mean, you had to be the man, right? The high priest. If you wanted to go into the to the outer courts, it was still priest only, but just a larger group. And then the outer, and then further and further, you could have Jewish men. And then out here, you could have Jewish women. And then once once you got out to the what they, the borders of the temple, they had they had people out there that would turn people away or tell them, "Hey, you know, over there in a parking lot, why Gentile parking lot? Why for you? Once you're over there." So Jesus sees all this. And what he does is he just carries it over and he says, I don't want my church to be about the temple. Not only that, I don't even want my church to be like the temple. That's why I know that's why he put it in here because as Jesus is making this big stir within the religious community, this is one of the main reasons why they said, man, we have got to get rid of this dude. We've got to get him out of here. He's messing with our temple. We've got to get him out of here. But they look at him and they say, what sign... Are you going to give us to show us that you have the authority to be doing what you're doing right now? He says, you want a sign? He said, the sign is this. 
you will throw this temple down and in three days I'll raise it right back up. Or is that three days? Again, that John puts in the same chapter. In three days I'll raise it up again. This temple took us 46 years and is still under construction and you're going to raise it up in three days? And he didn't say another word. He didn't say another word about it. But when he said that, in the, if you read this book, the whole chapter, it said it sparked something within the boys. And it said the scriptures that he told them jumped within their spirits. And it says that they remembered what Jesus said. So the whole chapter, every little nugget, every little sign, John is pointing back and saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I want you to see how Jesus done it. Because I don't want you to be no more like the temple. See, the church should be like a table, not the temple. Because that's what Jesus did at the wedding. He made sure that the party was going to keep going. He made sure everybody was happy. He made sure everybody had what they needed to do. And then when people walk in, Tom, come, come sit at the table. Come, come over here. It was no longer, and this is the, the difference between Old Covenant and New Covenant is Jesus wants everybody to come. It's no longer only the high priest that can walk into the Holy of Holies. It's not only a certain group of people that can go to the outer courts. It's, I mean, if it was still that way, we wouldn't even have the right to think that we could go into the presence of God. So he said, I want this to be about family. I want this to be family-like. I don't want to be temple-like. I want to be table-like. I, I want the kingdom of God to be as if I am sitting with my best friend with no worries in the world, with good food and good drink and everybody loving one another and being family. Yeah. Celebrating, the covenant. Come on. Celebrating the covenant, Pastor Chip says. But I know in and of myself I have a real bad habit about wanting to go back to temple. I just do. I have a bad habit about wanting to put rules on myself. I have a bad habit about wanting to set a certain standard for myself. When really, when we got to look at the Word, and the Word says, you come as you are. And as we come as we are, then suddenly God turns us into the person that we have always meant to be. I mean, because if you think, there's nothing that I can do to change me. There's nothing that you can do to change you. So why should I sit and think about that stuff all the time and, and beat myself down with it and put extra layers of weight upon my shoulders thinking about what, what's brother so-and-so think about me or I wonder if they're talking about me or I wonder all, all the, you know, I'm, I'm just stacking weight upon myself. More weight and more weight. And Jesus wants to come along as apostle prophesied over my wife that his burden is light and his yoke is easy. And this covenant that he's given us is a covenant that not only can we never break, but it's a covenant that is too good to be true. With that, I was out, I've been on zeros for a long time, I think. But I'll, I'll, I'll close it up with that. Well, Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are the God, Lord, that leads us guides us, directs us, Father God, in this new covenant that you've given us. So Lord, I pray this. I pray that my brothers and sisters and myself, Father God, would continue to get new glimpses, Father God, of what we actually have, what we can actually walk in, Father God, what we actually have in Christ. Father, because I believe this with my whole heart, that we are a potent and powerful people, Father God. But Lord, that has to be a revelation. So Lord, I pray this. Let us know who we are. Or better yet, let us believe who you say we are. So Lord, I praise you and I thank you for these things. I give you glory for all of it. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen.